Thank you for joining us for this afternoon's session. We will be hearing from a fantastic keynote speaker, followed by the very popular Minister's Roundtable. I'd like to welcome a brief video message from our first session sponsor, CLAC. C-L-A-C. We're a union that believes there's more to work than just work. A workplace is a community where everyone comes together to achieve a common goal. Founded in 1952, we're Canada's largest independent national multi-sector union. Over 60,000 members working in construction, healthcare, retail, transportation, and other sectors. CLAC members have built and continue to build some of the country's largest infrastructure projects. CLAC collective agreements include all the trades you require in one agreement. One team, all working together to get the job done. We strive to make better workplaces based on cooperation, partnership, respect, dignity. CLAC is a labor partner committed to building strong relationships with Indigenous communities. We're a full service union, committed to building better workplaces, better communities, better lives. Whatever project you are dreaming of, no matter the location, scope, or sector, CLAC members are ready to go to work to help make your dream a reality. CLAC, we're better together. Learn more at clac.ca. Thank you, CLAC, for your support of the 2021 Forum. This afternoon, we'll hear from our keynote speaker, Roger Dallantonia. Bridget Anderson, President and CEO of the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade, is joining us to moderate a fireside chat. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce Roger Dallantonia. Roger is the President and Chief Executive Officer for Fortis BC and Fortis BC Energy, overseeing electricity and natural gas business operations. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging Fortis BC's respect for Indigenous peoples in this place we call Canada, and on whose traditional territories we all live, work, and play. Fortis BC has long supported engagement with Indigenous communities and building strong relationships based on respectful dialogue that create mutually beneficial opportunities. I'm presenting today from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, whose oral histories have connected them to this land since time immemorial. This event provides an important opportunity for dialogue on resource development in BC. And I'd like to express my appreciation to the event organizers for holding this event in this revised format. I also want to recognize the efforts of this government for the actions they've taken to keep British Columbians safe and support those in need during the COVID-19 pandemic. We are appreciative of the public service of healthcare providers and essential workers who are keeping our citizens healthy and safe. As we look forward into the new year and beyond, Forest BC is committed to building a stronger and more resilient economy while delivering the energy our communities need. As the largest distributor of energy in BC, we are a key enabler of the government's goals of improving affordability, continuing reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, and addressing climate change. Since we gathered in Prince George last year, we've maintained our focus on affordable and reliable energy solutions, while working collaboratively with government and stakeholders to deliver on the promise of clean BC, which is what I'll be speaking about today. So first, I'll start with a quick background about Fortis BC and our climate ambitions. We are part of the broader Fortis Inc. family of companies, based out of Newfoundland and Labrador. We are an integrated gas and electric utility, providing service to 1.2 million homes and businesses across BC. We provide service to 135 communities and 57 Indigenous communities across BC. We are the largest provider of energy in the province, and we understand the critical importance of resilient and affordable energy system. We're also focused on taking meaningful climate action. Forest BC was the first gas primary utility in Canada to announce a GHE reduction target, a 30% reduction of our customers' emissions by 2030. We call this target 30 by 30. 
It demonstrates our commitment to a lower carbon future. We are focused on leading an active partnership between customers, communities, industry and government to help achieve it. We believe that both our gas and electric systems are critical to our province achieving our long-term GHG reduction goals while maintaining affordable and reliable energy supply to our customers. So how we achieve our 30 by 30 goal? We have a long-term strategy called our Clean Growth Pathway to 2050, which is created in response to the BC government's request for submissions as part of the development of Clean BC. The Clean Growth Pathway leverages the decarbonization potential of both the gas and electric energy systems to lead the way to a lower carbon economy and help achieve emission reduction targets. We identified four key pillars, the building blocks for the GHG reductions we seek to achieve. With respect to energy efficiency, we see ourselves tripling our investment in energy efficiency and conservation to the tune of nearly 100 million per year by 2022. As a result, we are among the largest investors in energy efficiency in Canada. Renewable gas and hydrogen are also opportunities we're pursuing. We are the first utility in North America to offer renewable natural gas to our residential customers starting in 2011. Since then, we've expanded our supply of renewable natural gas and are pursuing other low carbon gases such as hydrogen. Our short-term outlook sees us increasing the supply of renewable gas from less than 1% of our total energy delivered to over 10% in the next five years. As part of Clean BC, our target is to have 15% of our gas supply provided by renewable gases. We believe we are well on our way. In both our utilities, we are also focused on promoting the adoption of low carbon and zero emission vehicles. Forest BC has commissioned 35 electric vehicle charging stations across the southern interior with more stations under construction. We're also promoting fuel switching from diesel to low carbon compressed natural gas. To date, we've converted a thousand vehicles across the province to natural gas. In partnership with BC Ferries and C-SPAN, we're using LNG instead of higher carbon marine fuels to reduce GHG emissions as well as improve air pollution locally. An opportunity exists to fuel trans-Pacific vessels with BC LNG to achieve significant global greenhouse gas emissions reductions. The LNG that we provide from our facility is the lowest carbon in the world, in some instances more than 30% less carbon intensive than other global suppliers. Reducing the greenhouse gas emissions associated with trade presents both an economic and environmental opportunity for our province, and we look forward to working with government to advance this shared priority. In summary, Forest species energy infrastructure has significant carbon reduction potential. Last year, we engaged Guidehouse, a global energy and environmental consultancy, to analyze pathways to achieve our long-term emissions targets. They model two pathways, delivering the same emissions reductions, a predominantly electric approach versus an integrated approach utilizing both the gas and electric delivery systems. The result of their work show that an optimized approach that leverages both systems avoids significant costs while providing greater resiliency and affordability. The Guidos report, which is available on our Fortis BC website, concluded that the optimal pathway shouldn't be an either electrification or gas approach. We need both through a diversified approach. Building a reliable, affordable, clean energy system is the key challenge. As we move toward a lower carbon future, the challenge is how to balance the demands of affordable, reliable, and renewable energy. With operations spanning upstream gas storage, hydroelectric generation, natural gas and electricity distribution, and low carbon geothermal systems, we take a broad perspective to energy delivery. Because of the significant scale of energy that the gas system provides to British Columbians, and how cheaply it can store energy for seasonal use, we believe it is a critical asset to achieve emissions reductions while maintaining a reliability and affordability. Practically speaking, this means we need to recognize the potential of the gas system to make significant carbon reductions 
through renewable gases and energy efficiency and allow it to meet the significant thermal energy load to heat homes and businesses. This will ensure that the electric system is optimized on higher value decarbonization options, like in the transport sector, which is the single largest source of emissions in the province, or upstream oil and gas production. This is our long-term vision for Fortis BC, a low carbon energy utility providing resilient and affordable energy to our customers across the province. We know that using Fortis BC's established electricity and natural gas infrastructure to invest in innovative solutions like renewable gases and zero carbon transportation will help BC achieve its ambitious 2050 emissions reductions target. We're supportive of government policy that recognizes that both energy delivery systems will be needed to meet our shared GHE reduction goals. We believe it is important to invest, upgrade and support our current infrastructure to be able to utilize innovative decarbonization technologies and to ensure we can reliably deliver energy to our customers. Thank you. Thanks so much for that overview, Roger. I'm delighted to join you to further discuss your, your thoughts uh, about energy delivery for a couple of minutes. And given the year that we've all just come through, I'd like to start with uh, some thoughts around COVID-19. How has the pandemic impacted any operations or planning for you? Uh, thanks for the question, Bridget. Um, you know, as a critical service provider in the province, an essential service, you know, our approach from day one was that everything we do is essential. So really it's what can we do safely? We did have to scale back on some of our operations. We did have to um, take certain measures, but our focus has always been to maintain the safe, reliable delivery of energy to our natural gas and electric customers. In the field, we, entered, uh, we ended up uh, adopting a number of new measures to, to deal with how you work socially distant, how you maintain uh, hygiene, but also how you can uh, work within the community uh, and keep our employees as well as our customers and the community safe. We have a very large office workforce and from day one we took the approach to put as many of our folks uh, in a work from home situation. This is a significant challenge for us. Uh, we have close to 2,500 employees across the province. Uh, so it wasn't an easy task, but uh, with the support of our folks, uh, we were able to transition pretty much our entire office-based workforce to a work from home setting. Well, and it certainly isn't without its challenges, but uh, good to hear that uh, many of your people could actually work from home and, and be able to, uh, to do that. I want to touch on some of your comments about electrification that you made in your presentation. Can you expand on your approach to reducing emissions? Uh, yeah, so we're a supporter of, the, uh, of what I'd say is targeted electrification. We see uh, the value in using uh, what BC has as a low carbon uh, electric generation system. And, and use that in a targeted way. And what I mean by that is we see electrification really essential to decarbonization of the transport sector. Uh, transportation is around 40, 41% of emissions in BC. So we think there's a natural fit for electrification in the passenger vehicle uh, market. We also see uh, electrification being beneficial in upstream oil and gas production, uh, which is a priority for both the provincial as well as federal government. Uh, on some of their infrastructure uh, plans. But we also uh, know that in our jurisdiction, there's a significant uh, thermal load, and that's something that the natural gas delivery system is well suited to. Uh, the gas infrastructure uh, in Canada is a multi-billion dollar asset that is really well suited to the safe, reliable, efficient delivery of energy. It's also a system that uh, can be equipped to handle renewable energy in the form of renewable natural gas and hydrogen. So I look at this as a parallel to the electric uh, system. In jurisdictions where uh, electricity generation is high carbon or more carbon intensive, uh, the focus isn't limiting the ability for the electric delivery system to deliver what would be higher carbon electricity. The focus is how do you decarbonize that electricity by bringing on renewables um, to reduce the carbon intensity of electricity. 
I think the natural gas industry uh, can draw a parallel from that. The system itself uh, is well suited to adopt greater and greater uh, forms of renewable energy. Uh, for us, the focus to do so is renewable gases, including hydrogen, and we think we're, uh, we're on the road to a, a very significant uh, opportunity here in decarbonizing uh, the, the natural gas system. And you're focused on customer emissions, not just operations. So why is that? Uh, for us, it's a question of scale. So if you think about well, British Columbia, uh, I think the domestic emissions are around 64 million tonnes. Uh, when you look at uh, our operations, we're a very efficient uh, gas and electric delivery system. I think our emissions are in the range of 200,000 tonnes relative to the 64 million tonnes. So when we look on where we can make the biggest impact on emissions reductions, while we are taking action within our own operations uh, to reduce our footprint, we see a significant opportunity in uh, helping customers reduce their emissions. The focus for us, uh, if we're successful in our 30 by 30 plan, uh, we'll see about 4 million tonnes of emissions reduced annually. Uh, our focus there will be energy efficiency, it'll be low carbon uh, and zero uh, carbon uh, transportation opportunities. Uh, and the two big opportunities are again renewable gases as well as LNG for marine transport. And you did mention the need for diversification throughout your presentation. Uh, you started your presentation talking about Indigenous relations and in fact uh, at this uh, BC Natural Resource Forum and previous ones this has been spoken about. It's a topic that is very important as well, you know, particularly as it relates to UNDRIP. So I'd like to get you to expand your thoughts on that and Fortis BC's approach around in, in Indigenous relations. So at the core of everything we do is really how do we deliver energy safely, reliably, and sustainably to our communities. And that includes our Indigenous communities. We've got a history of partnership with Indigenous communities uh, and it's a focus for us uh, moving forward. You know, our, our uh, uh, past uh, approach to Indigenous relations uh, goes back a number of years. Uh, I trace it back to 2001 where we adopted our statement of indigenous uh, principles and, and those principles guide us today and they really are rooted in a respectful uh, dialogue with our indigenous communities. Uh, a few other examples of things we've been uh, fortunate enough to achieve uh, in uh, 2011 with our Mount Hayes uh, LNG storage facility on Vancouver Island. We were able to partner with the Shemanis First Nation, the Cowichan tribes, uh, and provide significant uh, uh, job creation as well as uh, partnership uh, uh, on that project with those two uh, Indigenous communities. Uh, with respect to our Eagle uh, Mountain to Wood Fiber Gas Pipeline project, uh, we worked closely with the Squamish Nation to adopt their environmental assessment uh, protocol uh, one of the first of its kind in Canada where we were closely with the Squamish to address uh, uh, pipeline uh, impacts uh, with respect to uh, their interests on their land as well as ensuring their uh, as, as well as ensuring uh, uh, a, a greater focus on economic benefit for them in that project. So you know those two examples uh, are, are uh, for us uh, how we want to engage with Indigenous communities as we pursue uh, energy projects, in particular renewable energy projects, uh, going forward. Roger, it has been uh, a very challenging 2020 and we are now at the beginning of 2021. And so a final thought from you about uh, how you're feeling about the year ahead, optimistic for recovery. Um, give me any kind of thoughts about what you're thinking as you plan ahead for this coming year. I am, I am optimistic. Obviously, uh, BC is still in the midst of the pandemic and we are uh, focused on uh, ensuring that we get through the next number of months uh, with as little impact as, as possible. We know that the pandemic has had a significant impact on folks across the province. Um, but I am hopeful. I, I see uh, discussions around the, vac the vaccine uh, and the rollout happening here uh, in the next number of months. Um, uh, as far as the economic uh, impacts, 
Uh, you know, we're in a, a, a critical space energy infrastructure, and we see infrastructure leading the way in many ways in the economic recovery. We have a number of uh, uh, opportunities in BC to uh, invest uh, across our system. Uh, we see the opportunity to invest in uh, renewable uh, low carbon projects as well. So I think that we have a, a role to lead or help lead uh, the economic recovery here as we deal with the pandemic uh, in 2021. Roger, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thanks, Bridget. Thank you both to Roger D'Antonia and Bridget Anderson for sharing their insights this afternoon with us. Please return to the agenda and select the next session to view the live stream, the Minister's Roundtable, sponsored by Tourmaline Oil Corp. We will see you in a few minutes.